Okay, it looks like we're at a pretty stable number of participants, so we'll get going. Good evening, I'm Steve Engel, the Chancellor of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Zoom meeting focused on residential students, and we hope to be able to answer some of your questions this evening. Um, this session will run approximately one hour. Um, if we run out of questions earlier, we can certainly finish early. Um, and uh, tonight we will have uh, several people who are answering your, your questions that have been submitted or those that will be uh, submitted live during using the uh, question and answer function. Dr. Richard Brown, Executive Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration. Um, Dr. Jerry Hale, Provost and Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Dr. Yancey Freeman, Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs. And Dr. Chris Smith, Chief Health Affairs Officer. And Ms. Abir Mustafa, Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Now, before we respond to, to questions, I wanna thank each of you for joining us um, in the Zoom meeting for your confidence in us. It's a pleasure to welcome our new mocks. And uh, I, we've been working very hard um, ever since this coronavirus uh, pandemic began so that we could open safely for this fall. We focused on two things. We focused on the safety of our campus community and the quality of our academic programs and the educational experience for our students. And we're gonna to continue to keep doing that as we move uh, into operations this fall. I, I uh, should note, uh, as we respond to questions that you asked tonight, there are just a few of us answering questions, but there's an incredible team of hundreds of people who have worked thousands of hours um, getting ready for the fall, putting in place these uh, procedures that we'll discuss uh, this evening. And uh, please realize that things can change quickly. And uh, if uh, what we tell you tonight is uh, something that, that changes down the road, you know, we're learning more and more about this COVID-19 um, as every day goes by, and we are continuing to put new knowledge into our operating procedures. So we have a, a large number of submitted questions. We hope to get through all of those. Um, we'll try and take questions um, live uh, during this. And in the event that we do not get everything answered, we will um, copy the questions out of the question and answer box and get answers to these and post them on our COVID-19 website. And we'll send you a link to where you can find uh, the questions and answers for this particular session. So we uh, appreciate you being here. And tonight, now I would like to introduce Susan Lazenby, who is one of our moder moderators for this evening. Susan. Thank you so much, Dr. Engel. Hi, I'm Susan Lazenby from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and my colleague Laura Cagle and I will be the monitors for today's webinar. Laura? Chancellor Engel mentioned, we'll begin tonight's session with questions that were submitted ahead of time. If you have any questions throughout this session, you can submit them through the Q&A function near the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them as we can. Let's get started. Our first section of questions will deal with housing and residence life. So Abir, I know you're ready to answer those. Our first question is, if I cancel housing for this semester since my classes are online, Will I be able to reapply for housing next semester if classes are back on campus? The answer is absolutely. We would love to have you back in the spring semester. Um, if you cancel your housing, you, we have extended our date through August 7th as our cancellation date for a full refund of the deposit for our students. Thank you so much, Abir. The next question is for you as well. What is the COVID fast pass for move in? Great. The COVID Fast Pass it gives you a clear um, indication that you have completed the six steps to getting your uh, keys at MoveIn. Um, and you can find this information at our uh, housing.edu, utchousing.edu, and MoveIn Operation MoveIn. The first step is to have the immunization record cleared. 
The second is to sign in your moving agreement and, and addendums. The third process is to have a check-in appointment. The fourth step is to submit um, a MOX photo ID. So you can have your MOX cards because you need those to swipe in again into the housing uh, communities. The fifth process is completing a COVID screening form. And then you will be emailed a fast pass. So when you pull up, you can either print it or have it on your phone. Once you show the fast pass, you get a um, process like Chick-fil-A where they bring you a basket with your keys in it. You pick up your keys and off you go to your residence hall. So it's a, it's a seamless process for moving. Thank you, Abir. One more housing question. I'm signed up to live on campus this year. A few of my classes are now online and I'm wanting to move the others online because of coronavirus. Am I going to be penalized and lose the deposit I had to pay? Things have changed a lot in the past month, so I don't think this should help be held against me. Absolutely not. We are refunding all the deposits through August 7th. So if you are wanting to cancel, just submit your cancellation form and we'll get you canceled and uh, refund on your deposit. Thank you so much, Abir. Our next section of questions will be about campus recreation. Dr. Freeman, this question is for you. Are there going to be any on-campus events? Well, we certainly are planning for uh, on-campus events, and I will say, uh, I just want to reiterate and emphasize what the Chancellor has said, and that is, we're really excited to have our students back and uh, anticipate having a, a vibrant student life component of this as well. Uh, as well as the stuff that we're adding in, uh, offering in the classroom, we know it is vitally important for students to have opportunities outside the classroom for their physical and mental well-being, uh, for health, uh, for all of those things. And so it is our absolute goal to offer opportunities on campus events for students. Uh, I will say that they are going to look differently than any other year that we've had before. And so uh, typically, if you remember the first of the year for students who are returning who are with us tonight, uh, we have an Oak Street Roast and we probably have 3,000 people outside at the Oak Street Roast. So we're probably not going to do an event like that, but we will do things like a movie night out on Chamberlain Field for students to engage in. You're going to see us do uh, intramural activities uh, for students to be able to engage in. Uh, we're opening up the riverfront so that for those of you who are bold enough to do uh, rafting or whatever uh, thrills you about the water, you'll have opportunities to do it. Uh, student organizations are still going to sponsor events as well as our student engagement area, uh, student and family engagement area around campus activities. And so it is our goal and desire to have events that are, will be held on campus for students, but we will do them safely, requiring a face covering, a mask, requiring social distancing, but it is going to be, uh, we intend to keep the fun coming, so. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. On that same note, we've got a question about the ARC. Uh, will it be open? Will, will the hours change? Uh, will there be a limited number of students allowed in at a time? And will people have to wear masks when they work out? Yes, yeah, so absolutely, the ARC is going to be open. Uh, at one point, uh, Abir Mustafa, Ms. Mustafa, who's on the line with, it, with us, told me that uh, about half of our students had visited the ARC in one semester, individual sort of spikes and visits. So we know it's a huge part of campus life and a great part of, of a chance for students to engage. So it is going to be open. We are uh, following uh, CDC and professional health guidelines about keeping it open and sanitizing everything that's there. Uh, the, um, you're going to see social distancing in place when you visit the ARC this fall. And so not every treadmill is gonna be up and functioning. You'll likely see every other one that's there uh, that will be functioning. Machines will be, you know, not every machine is going to be functioning. We've done some moving around uh, of equipment to space it out so the students can come in and exercise and work out uh, at their leisure. Uh, it is our goal not to change the hours uh, for this upcoming term uh, because we know we're going to have to limit the capacity for some of the students who are coming in. Uh, it was our goal not to cut hours for the art, but to even look at how we can expand and give other opportunities for students to come in uh, for those of you who like to work out really late at night, I'm usually in bed, but if you want to work out really late at night, you do have an opportunity to do that in the ARC as well. So we plan to have it fully functioning and working 
uh, with social distancing in place. Uh, I want to just emphasize before I leave this question that uh, we anticipate and expect students will who come in to work out that like with any other gym facility, you'll come in and clean, uh, use sanitizing wipes to wipe equipment down prior to using it. And then when you finish, that you'll do the same thing to wipe that equipment down for the next person who's coming. Uh, our goal is to keep it safe uh, and healthy for everyone. And so that is going to be a practice. You'll see, remind, you'll see reminders in the ARC around doing it. Uh, within the ARC with signs, and then uh, we'll have staff walking around to help remind folks as well. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. The next question is for you as well. What will clubs, intramurals, fraternities, and sorority activities look like? Yeah, that's a, that is an interesting question also because uh, life for, in particular, our fraternities and sororities will look different this upcoming year. We just, uh, um, had to put out a decision, made a decision, and received information from the uh, National Panhellenic uh, Council, the National Organization, and also the Interfraternity Council about recruitment process, that it is going to be all online uh, this upcoming fall. And while I know that is not the most desired sort of way to do that, uh, it is what has come from those national organizations. And so we are going to implement those for the fall and to make sure that things go. Uh, we are talking with our student organizations about how to do things in an innovative way, in an entrepreneurial way, um, you know, as we go forward. So we've said to them for any inside uh, meetings that they might have that they need to limit that number to 30 when space uh, would accommodate that opportunity for them to do up to 30. Uh, we have lots of organizations that have more members than 30, uh, thankfully. And in those cases, we're saying to them that you can have a number of successive meetings. So if you have 60 members in your organization, you might want to have two meetings uh, at different times so that every member can participate. Or you might want to have a meeting, invite up to the first 30 people, and then live stream it so that other people can join virtually. So there are ways for us to do this that will keep us safe in the space that we have. Uh, and that's, you know, that's our goal for this upcoming fall. And so if, if you're asking how that will look, it will, we'll have some face-to-face -face things, we'll have some virtual things, and then online opportunities for students to uh, participate and engage as well. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Dr. Smith, um, what are UTC's plans to enforce or encourage social distancing and mask wearing? And what will the consequences for not following these new rules be? Thank you, Laura. I want to start out by sharing some information that I got this afternoon when I was on a call with a, a group from across the UT system. There's a physician from Memphis who is actually leading this task force, and he's helping Memphis with their response to COVID. And we were talking about mask use and the importance of it. And he said in Memphis now, they have a 93% compliance rate for mask use. And because of that, they're seeing a tremendous decrease in the number of positive cases, which then leads to less need for testing and the labs are not really being overtaxed. So once they put their mask mandate in place, they really, and people actually followed it, uh, they saw a very positive response. So that is a real life example of the importance of using face masks. So to encourage the use of face masks and in essence, social distancing, we are going to educate the campus regarding the effectiveness of these strategies. And then we'll present some data that, we've, that we have, such as what I just presented to you all, that show when mask use and social distancing are not adhered to, how this impacts the rate of positive cases, which I think is a very good starting point for us to understand why this is so important. We've seen the cases in Chattanooga and Hamilton County trend up. And uh, I have to be quite honest, not everybody in our area is wearing a mask, but it's such a simple strategy to have such a positive impact. So we really are going to have a very significant focus on that using media campaigns and student staff education mo modules and social contracts among not only students, but faculty and staff. We're also launching a program on campus in regard to bystander intervention and how to appropriately ask those around us 
to please use your mask and remain six feet apart. Uh, we're gonna roll that out across the campus. I was um, wa uh, walking across campus with Miss Mustafa last week and there was uh, one of our uh, people going through the housing or riding up to housing in a golf cart and he had a couple of people with him and they had their masks on and this gentleman didn't and I just looked at him I said put your mask on he pulled it right out of his pocket and put it right back on so I think we're going to have to spend some time with gentle reminders um, saying that yeah please do this it really it really works and it's very important now if the student doesn't do that um, we they continue to ignore the request for social distancing or using their masks then the Dean of Students office will intervene and they'll take over and deal with the student if it's an employee we have same type of consequences human resources will address the concern Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Dr. Brown, the next question is for you. Um, with us returning to campus, how will the food court, classrooms, and even the library be arranged? Will there be markers telling us where to sit and stand? Will the hours of places on campus change? Well, let me first uh, start by saying, like all of my colleagues, we want to welcome the students back to the campus. Your campus is just beautiful right now. I'm sitting in my office looking out the window now. All the trees are bloom flowers are everywhere. The only thing we're missing is all of you. So we're looking forward to having all of you back to the campus. We've worked really, really hard in the last three months to really realign and redesign the campus to make sure it's safe uh, for social distancing according to CDC guidelines. So when you return, you're going to see six feet spacing throughout our buildings, within your classrooms, even inside the university center. We've uh, elected to use our mascot's feet, Scrappy's little feet, uh, to represent uh, the floor markers for six feet of social distancing uh, when you come into certain buildings. Within the University Center in our food court area, you will see us practice social distancing there. You will see the markers on the floor to make sure you stay safe. We've redesigned uh, the seating to accommodate social distancing within the UC and the main food court. We've also extended the dining area into the Chattanooga room to accommodate more students to effectively have social distancing while you are uh, having a meal within the UC. We're also exploring the option of have, having outside seating, a tent area within various areas on the campus to allow you the option to eat outside uh, more conveniently. Within Crossroads, you will see us practice social distancing there as well. Our food concept will also change. You'll see us do a lot more grab and go uh, pre-ordering of food that you can take with you, along with all meals being served by chefs. You will see us do that. No more a la carte meals uh, around the campus where you serve yourself. So you will have meals fully served. We're implementing a new, uh, where you can order to go. We're gonna be, have a food delivery service on campus for the first time. We will test that this semester. So when you long for a pizza there in the residence halls, you can call and we'll deliver that to you. Uh, so we're excited uh, about that. Our classrooms also are socially distanced uh, within the seating area to practice six feet of separation within our classroom uh, areas as well. So even within the library, you will see us practice social distancing there in all areas within the library as you utilize that facility. At Starbucks, you will not have a dine-in option at Starbucks. You will be able to order on the go, but we're adding outside tinning overhead to make sure that you are uh, held harmless from the elements outside, keep the heat off of you while you're standing in line, getting ready to order that th those Starbucks. So we're gonna really, really focus on social distancing. Again, the chancellor has said, we wanna make sure that you are safe on our campus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Dr. Hale, can you explain how social distancing will be enforced in labs since there will need to be group work for those classes? Uh, yes, and let me join my colleagues by welcoming you all back to campus. We're really looking forward to your arrival. Uh, many of you will be involved in labs, whether they are natural science labs, whether they are labs in our um, health programs or whether they are labs in our engineering programs. We expect students to socially distance in our labs 
And we also have cleaning protocols in place, similar to the ones that Dr. Freeman explained with regard to the equipment in the ARC. So what we expect students to do if they're working on a piece of equipment in one of the laboratories is to disinfect the equipment before they begin their work. And then if there's a rotation uh, at that uh, workstation with another student, uh, we expect them to wipe the piece of equipment down again and disinfect it uh, when they complete their rotation. And we expect the next student to step up and do the same thing. And so what we hope to have in place then is a cleaning protocol so that each piece of equipment is cleaned twice before someone uses it. And that social distancing of six feet uh, is involved. So there might be a little less group work, um, but still we think that some of the same kinds of things that you've seen in labs in the past can still happen, but that there will be fewer people in the labs and, uh, and so that it can still take place from a distance with the folks who are working in the lab at six feet apart. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. Dr. Freeman, the next question is for you. Will parents or students be able to attend sports events? Oh, that's a magnificent question and one that I think we are uh, still waiting to find out the answer. I know that our, our athletics director, uh, Mark Warden, is still working with the Southern Conference sponsors and uh, with the conference that we are a part of and talking about it every day to try to figure out a response to, uh, to that answer. And I may call on the chancellor to help me with answering that question. He might have a more up-to-date information than I do around where we are in terms of our sports teams and uh, athletic teams and where that is. So the answer is it's going to depend on the sport, probably. Um, the athletic directors have been meeting for our athletic conference, the Southern Conference, twice a week. The chancellors and presidents have a, a meeting uh, this Thursday to talk about this. Um, football is something we'd all like to see, but right now the city of Chattanooga is not allowing Finley Stadium to be used for events because of the high level of uh, coronavirus cases. So um, the Chattanooga Football Club has two games this weekend, soccer matches, and they will not be played with a audience. They will be played without uh, fans in the stands. So we'll uh, work at this. Golf may have an easy time um, being outside and other sports we'll just have to see. We would love to have an opportunity for students to uh, cheer on um, their student athlete colleagues and for parents to be able to see their students uh, in competition. So we'll do everything we can uh, to, to make this work. Thank you so much, Dr. Engel. We had a live question that I would like to use as a follow-up for Dr. Hale. Dr. Hale, could you talk about what's going to happen with theater? Will they still be able to have shows? I think theater will uh, be able to have some performances, I believe. Um, they will not all be live performances necessarily. And uh, the live performances may involve smaller audiences. But I, uh, I believe that our theater uh, students and faculty members are uh, planning on uh, plotting forward. Uh, it's the old show business adage, the show must go on. And uh, they firmly believe that, and they're going to try to bring those to us. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Another question for you. If a faculty member is unable to participate in their classes, how will students be notified? Will that class have to halt for two weeks, or will things continue? We will use many of the same uh, protocols or processes that we would use in any ordinary semester. It is uncommon, but occasionally happens in any semester um, that a faculty member experiences an illness and can't meet uh, his or her class. When that happens, uh, the department head works to find a suitable uh, professor to, or faculty member uh, to fill in during the time that the faculty member is going to be absent. So we don't expect any gap in classes at all. Um, we expect the classes to uh, continue to operate, and we know that department heads are planning ahead and beginning to think about 
you know, what would happen in certain circumstances and who they have that can fill in in which particular classes. And so we expect classes to continue um, even with uh, an occasional illness that might take place uh, with one of our faculty. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. Dr. Engel, the next question is, will UTC consider having a student task force dedicated to maintaining COVID-19 regulations on campus, such as mask and PPE safety, cleanliness in high traffic areas, and upholding standards to policy? We certainly want students involved and engaged, and I'm gonna call on um, Dr. Freeman to help with, with this one. But also having the uh, authority to follow through, to get things done, to command resources. Um, if it's just a student run committee, there may be some issues there. So I think student participation, absolutely. This is going to require our entire campus community to work together as a team if we're gonna be successful. Um, and we plan to be successful. So Dr. Freeman? Yeah, thank you, Chancellor. I, I would, the only thing I would add to that is we are preparing some bystander intervention training uh, for students, faculty, and staff. The most difficult thing sometimes is to uh, remind someone that they're not complying with the university policy. And so how do you do that in a way that is uh, positive and progressive and productive and does not offend? And so this training that, uh, that I have seen that's coming out is going to help us with guiding folks around how to do it. Um, I can't emphasize enough to you that it is imperative for uh, our campus community to comply with the standards that are in place around wearing a face covering, social distancing, hand, you know, using hand sanitizer and soap and water uh, even more frequently uh, as you can throughout the day in order to keep everyone safe. Uh, and so student participation is the correct term, perhaps not student led, but student participation uh, in helping us to engage your friends and colleagues and even loved ones that are on campus around compliance. Thank you, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Engel. Uh, Dr. Hale, question for you. I don't want to risk being exposed to the virus and bringing it home to my family. Both my parents fall into high risk category, and I know we will be wearing masks and social distancing on campus, but there's still a risk of encountering asymptomatic people. I would feel much safer if UTC accommodated my preference to stay at home. I think if a student wants to stay at home and uh, have a schedule that is completely online, um, the last time I checked, which was uh, quite recently, there were still online and face-to-face uh, -face, uh, sections of classes that were available. And I would encourage the students uh, who would like to have an online schedule to continue looking uh, and going through the scheduling process um, every day, looking for open uh, seats in online sections of classes. Um, it is also the case that a number of our classes will be running parallel sections so that if there is a, a rotating uh, attendance for the class, for example, um, it doesn't mean that you only have class a third of the time or, or half the time. It means that you have class all of the time, but half of the time or a third of the time you're in class and present. The other times you are uh, studying virtually or in an online format, and I think if a student wants to do that, he or she should speak with the professor and just indicate to them that they're enrolled in that face-to-face -face class, but ask about the possibility of studying completely from a distance and, and see what sort of response one gets. It's also the case that if you're having trouble, we want to encourage you to use the waitlist system uh, currently because it is the waitlist system that Dr. Freeman and I use and, and monitor closely to decide if additional sections need to be offered. And uh, depending on the preferences that students ex um, express by using the waitlist system, that tells us whether we need to add more face-to-face -face seats or whether we need to add more online seats. And so I would encourage persistence, uh, regular checking of the schedule, 
and then also using the waitlist uh, process so it will help us uh, as we make decisions about what additional seats we need to add. But I think we can accommodate requests like the one that the student has. Thank you, Dr. Hale. And one follow up uh, on that that we've had a live question on. I have two labs this semester and they are both either hybrid or online. How will online labs work? Well, all online classes will work in the following ways. And for those of you who are returning students, um, you shouldn't be expecting your classrooms to look exactly like they looked the last time that you might have been in them. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, we are following the protocols that have been put in place by the American College Health Association, by the CDC. Um, one of the recommendations that they're making is that in any classroom, we not have more than 30 people. There will be a few instances where exceptions are made to that policy for very specific reasons, but most of our, our rooms will hold 30 people or less. And what that means is that even if a room is much larger, um, the room will, uh, in addition to that, will have social distancing protocols in place. And we've had people go through every single one of our classrooms to, uh, to make sure that the seating is arranged so that um, students will be seated uh, six feet away from the next closest person to them. What that's done is it's cut down on our seating capacity uh, considerably. And so one of the things you'll notice whether you're going into a lab or whether you're going into, um, let's say, a lecture or recitation class, is that there will be certain seats that you will not be able to sit in. There will be other seats that are available for you to sit in um, and or uh, tables for you to use if it's a lab or something of that sort. And, uh, and so what will happen is um, for most of the hybrid classes, most of the hybrid classes will work on a rotating schedule um, and exactly how the rotation will work will depend on the number of days in the week that the class is meeting, how many students are enrolled uh, in the class, and a couple of other things. But essentially what happens, let's say you have a Tuesday, Thursday class, it means that um, usually um, half of the class will come to class on Tuesday, Half of the class will come on Thursday. You may rotate depending on the week, whether you're coming on a Tuesday or a Thursday, but your professor will let you know what the rotation is. And what the rotation allows us to do is it allows us to keep those social distancing protocols in place. The other students will be looking at the class in, in a virtual uh, setting uh, or in an online setting. And in some labs, what will happen is um, you will just come um, to half of the lab sessions and be working at the equipment or in the lab during the days that you're assigned to be there. I'm sorry, that was a really, really long answer, um, but it's a really important question. And all of that is to say, none of your classrooms are going to look like they did last fall or last spring. Thank you so much, Dr. Hale. Dr. Smith, the next question is for you. Will students need testing for COVID before going back to school? No, we are not requiring testing before you come back to school and there's an evidence-based reason why not. Because as we all know, testing is only a snapshot in time. So for example, if you tested on August 1st and you get your results back and they're negative, that's great, but that's only for that particular time. And you really can't be sure if you've been exposed from that time from August 1st until you actually come on campus. So that's why we've tried not to, we have decided not to require testing. As everybody knows, there's asymptomatic people throughout our communities and exposure really uh, continues to be a real concern. The best testing method actually to understand what our student, populate, student population reflects is the rapid testing, where you come in and you get tested and your results can be back to you as, as soon as 45 minutes. But um, we don't have that technology available to us at this time. We have put our name in the, in the hopper for the testing equipment. It's, as you can imagine, in high demand. So if we get that, then, then that'll be great for us. And we'll be very happy. But we do have several thousand send out tests, which the state has provided for us and for our campus. 
And what we'll do is we'll use those for large scale testing. So for example, if a dorm has a, an exorbitantly high number of positive cases, we will test the entire dorm. So a couple of hundred students at a time, we will send that out and we'll get the results back and then we'll be able to figure out where the dorm actually stands as far as having an outbreak on campus. But we also have an agreement with a lab, a statewide lab called PATH Group, and they ha we talked to them as recently as yesterday afternoon, and they feel very certain that they have enough testing supplies, reagent swabs, and that their labs can handle a 24 to 48 hour turnaround from the time they actually received the test in Nashville. We'll use this testing for symptomatic uh, students, faculty, or staff, or those who have been in close contact with, with somebody who's, who is a positive person, and then um, we'll actually use those tests to determine the status in, in closer time. The decision not to test before coming back was one that we talked about for a great length of time, but the UT system leaders have decided on, as, as a system-wide um, campus to not test people coming back prior to camp, coming to campus. The CDC and the World Health Organization, along with the American College Health Association, which Dr. Hale referenced, are not recommending campuses do this prior to coming to campus. But you will see that some campuses are come, some campuses will stu still do this. Um, a much more effective strategy would be for everybody to quarantine for 14 days before they came to campus. So that would mean that if I was going to be on campus on the 17th, I personally would have to stay in my home from August 3rd on and not go anywhere. And that's really a very simple concept but it's really, really difficult to do. So we are recommending that you watch your um, symptoms and you follow the standards that we've set all along, which is using a face mask, social distancing and washing your hands and monitoring whether you have a fever or those kind of things. But in any event, we want you to understand that you can reach out to us at University Health Center anytime and the number is, you all can find it on the web, but it's 423-425-2266, and we'll be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Could you also speak to how UTC will deal with positive cases on campus? Well, I'm going to speak more to residential students because that's who we're talking about tonight. So if you're a residential student and you test positive, or you're identified as a close contact of a person who is positive, we will move you to a temporary residence for the time period indicated by the university health officials in collaboration with the Hamilton County Health Department. We have a very close relationship with them and we talk to them quite office, often. The Office of Student Outreach and Support will be notified of a student specific COVID status and will communicate with, with the student. Sorry, I have a helicopter flying overhead. I don't know if we're being invaded or not. Apologize for that. It might be coming to land at UTC. It's kind of headed in that direction. So anyway, the student uh, outreach and support group will connect with uh, the student and tell them how to move about the campus and where they're going to be isolated. But more importantly, if you wish, they will connect with your parents. And that's only if you would like your parent to be involved in the conversations. The parent should remain in contact with you throughout your duration of quarantine or isolation in order to be informed about your situation. And if there are questions or concerns, the parent could contact the SOS department and discuss their issues. If the parent would prefer to have you at home or if you would prefer to be at home, that is permitted. But it's encouraged for you to think about this with your family and consider quarantining or isolating based on the recommendations for your particular family. If you have a, a parent or a sibling who is undergoing ch chemotherapy or is in an immune compromised situation and you have been diagnosed as positive or in close contact, we need to help you think through that because we really don't wanna put that person who is your family unit at risk. If you plan to quarantine or isolate off campus, the student would need to communicate this decision 
with the SOS and university health officials so we can make sure that we're there to support your care and make sure that you're getting the, the communications and the care that you need to get healthy very quickly. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, now we'll move on to academics. Dr. Hale, could you tell us what blended and hybrid courses will look like? I knew I should have saved some of that long answer from a few minutes ago, but your blended or hybrid courses will typically uh, function on a rotating schedule where, where you will attend class uh, online on some class days and you will attend class in person on other class days. Um, we are asking your faculty members to communicate with students uh, well in advance of the beginning of the semester so that you will know before the first day of class whether you should attend class the first day that your class meets or the second day that your class meets. Um, but that's essentially what those rotated or blended classes will look like. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Um, similar question, what will the first day of classes on the 17th look like? If we have hybrid classes, do we go to class on the first day? Um, that's, that's a great question. And again, uh, what I would be doing because uh, all of the classes I think are available for faculty members to start constructing their class out on Canvas currently. So you should look for uh, an email or a, uh, a Canvas communication um, from each of your professors if you have face-to-face -face classes or hybrid classes, classes that are gonna meet in that rotating schedule. Um, they should communicate with you whether or not you will be expected to be there on uh, day one or day two when the class meets. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Um, could you tell us if the semester will be divided differently and what the academic schedule will look like? Will the school year end early and omit a fall break? Um, yes and no, depending on the part of the question. The schedule will look different. Um, we have captured some additional instructional days, and uh, those days are going to be uh, Labor Day will now be an instructional day. Um, the fall break has been taken out of the fall calendar, and the days that would have been fall break will now be instructional days as well. We've done that purposely, and we've done that so that we can end the classroom instruction period um, before the Thanksgiving break. And so you will have classes up through the, the uh, Friday before uh, Thanksgiving. You will have the entire week of Thanksgiving off. And in fact, uh, once uh, you have finished uh, on that uh, Thursday or Friday, whenever your last class is before the Thanksgiving break, um, you will not be expected to come back to campus until the, uh, the spring semester. So that all final exams for the fall semester will be given online. Uh, none of the final exams will be given in a face-to-face -face format. And so those are the adjustments that we've made to the fall semester. And what we've done is we've done that for the purpose of public safety. What we'd like for you to do is to be able to finish up all of your coursework um, before Thanksgiving so that you can go home and stay home uh, for Thanksgiving instead of going to wherever it is that you might live, having contact with lots of people, maybe seeing old friends and, who are attending other universities and things like that, and then coming back to campus. That coming back to campus presented uh, a public health concern and we thought that it was best to go ahead and uh, and accelerate the schedule by uh, taking away Labor Day and removing the fall breaks so that you could have that entire week um, of, for Thanksgiving with no instructional days after it and then uh, your final exams. And Laura and uh, Sarah, if I, Susan, if I could uh, just add uh, to what the provost has already mentioned, and I know we'll get this question, so before it comes up, I want to address it. For students who are in the residence halls, we are not requiring you to move your things out of the residence hall over that Thanksgiving holiday uh, or, or over the Christmas holiday. You can leave those things there. Uh, we'll have them there safe and secure for you when you come back. 
uh, and ready for the spring semester. So we're not requiring anyone to move their things out unless you are graduating, finishing, then uh, of course you'll probably want to take your things with you. But otherwise you can leave those things, those items there and, and we'll have them there safely for you, uh, prepare for the spring. Thank you both. Uh, Dr. Hale, under what conditions will UTC cancel face-to-face -face classes and switch to an online only modality? Well, hot off the presses uh, from an email that I received from Dr. Smith this afternoon. You heard Dr. Smith earlier allude to a, a task force meeting that she was in with other people from the UT system earlier today. And from that meeting, uh, what came out of it were eight criteria that are gonna be used uh, for us to help decide whether to shift back to all online classes. And they include things like the overall campus health, the total number of cases on campus, the housing burden, whether or not we still have space to be able to quarantine and isolate students if we need to, appointment waiting times to get in to see uh, um, physicians or the people in our uh, campus um, health center, um, the contact tracing burden, um, the ability of, of our uh, campus staff to do contact tracing, um, PPE availability for uh, students, faculty and staff, also uh, what's happening in Hamilton County in terms of the number of, of uh, cases, the number of positive cases, and uh, the number of hospitalizations, and then our ability to maintain adequate staffing to provide to students the sorts of services that students are gonna need if they're on campus. So there is no single criterion that we're gonna use. There is no single measure that we're gonna use, but instead it will be a combination of those things and uh, uh, that, that we'll use if we make a decision that we need to move exclusively back to online instruction. Uh, Dr. Smith, what did I leave out? Not a thing. You did a very nice job. That's fine. The one, I guess I will say this, the one thing that's a little bit frustrating for, for all of us, and I, I've tried to explain this to Dr. Dawn Ford, who is serving as our chief epidemiologist, but she's the associate vice provost uh, for the Walker Teacher Center of Learning. Um, she's got about three hats she's wearing right now. And she talked to the health department this afternoon, and they said, there's really not one number where you, you, pull the trigger, it's kind of an overall picture. And as I'm also the director of the School of Nursing, I explained to her that 120 over 80 is a good blood pressure. 121 over 81 is not. I need that kind of definitive answer. And she says, we're not gonna get that definitive answer. We're just gonna have to look at it overall and, and we're developing a system of tracking. So if we see numbers, going up, more positive cases on campus, we'll do, we'll quickly try and identify what the reason is. Is it because uh, students are um, having uh, parties out in Chamberlain Field and not social distancing? Is it because faculty are getting together for dinner and they're not social distancing? We're gonna look at all the factors and maybe we can intervene and turn those numbers around like they did in Memphis. I feel like as we watch this and monitor this, there will be opportunities to intervene so that we don't have to switch to online. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Hale. Dr. Hale, we have a question that says, I am set to graduate in December, but one of my classes has reduced its size due to COVID and I am not able to take it. What can I do? We will do everything that we can possibly do to keep students on track for an on-time graduation. And so um, I, I hope the student who posed that question ahead of time is on the call this evening. Uh, if that student is on the call, then I would encourage you to immediately uh, talk to your academic advisor and also to reach out um, to the department head in the department where that class is being offered. There are any number of possibilities that can occur um, additional space might become available and a, a space might be able to be held for you. Um, it might be the case that an exception can be granted and we can go 
just a tad over. We can't do that uh, in, in every case. It will depend on the nature of the classroom that the class is scheduled in. But a, a, a third possibility is that a, a different class might be able to be substituted for um, the class that would have ordinarily have been the requirement. The, the key thing though is to reach out immediately to your academic advisor and or to the department head in the department where the class is being offered so that we can try to accommodate your needs. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Uh, we've got a little less than 10 minutes left, so we will continue um, with as many questions as we can get to. Um, Abir, we've had some live questions come through asking if um, students are still allowed to make housing changes. Is that the case or is it too late to make changes? No, absolutely. They can put in the request for transfers and changes. I will, you know, I will let you know the, the number one question has been, you know, I want a private room. We have very far and few private rooms available for our students, but I will tell you, we have personally gone into every room and measured beds to make sure they were six feet apart from each other. If it was five feet, 10 inches, we took the bed offline. We've taken many beds offline to ensure the, the safety of our students and very intentional about the space, not only in the common area, but also in the bedrooms for our students. So if you're interested in the um, housing changes or want to change your roommates, Please go online, put in your requests, and we're accommodating them as quickly as possible. Thank you, Abir. Uh, Dr. Hale, how will tests and exams be administered, virtually or in person? Uh, both. Uh, for classes that meet face-to-face, -face, it may well be the case that some of the exams will be given face-to-face -face as well. Um, in those classes, it may also be the case, however, that a faculty member opts to, uh, to give the exams uh, online. Um, we know that all final exams will be given as online final exams um, if they are given during the, uh, the, the week of final exams. And so uh, the exam formats won't necessarily change. It will depend on the nature of the courses in which the student is enrolled. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Dr. Hale, what if a student doesn't feel comfortable going to face-to-face -face classes, but needs those classes to graduate? I would uh, give the same advice that I gave to the student earlier who was unable to get into a class that was required for graduation. Um, we still have both face-to-face -face and online classes that are available to be uh, for uh, students to enroll in. And what I would recommend that the student do is uh, check early and often uh, in the scheduling um, software and try to enroll in classes that will help them stay on track for graduation. If they're not finding those classes, please reach out immediately to your, acad uh, to your academic advisor and or to your department head for the courses that you need and uh, see what sort of help they can give you, whether there are additional classes that can be approved to meet your degree requirements, whether they think additional sections of particular classes might be open and available to you or, or things like that. But, but the, the common theme in all of this is don't wait, uh, reach out immediately either to your academic advisor or to the department head in the department for the courses that you need. Thank you, Dr. Hale. Uh, Dr. Smith, we've had a pop-up question about the vaccine. Will we require the vaccine if it successfully becomes available? Yes, we will require COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine. And this is a system-wide decision. It's not just a UTC system, I mean, UTC decision. It, any student at the University of Tennessee, whether it's Martin, Knoxville, or Chattanooga will be required to get one. It, unless there are um, extenuating circumstances such as an allergy to one of the components, uh, it's medically not indicated or there is a religious um, concern and they would have to apply for a waiver. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Chancellor Engel, uh, the last pre-submitted question is for you. What steps will the university be taking to ensure more diversity and inclusion within the campus? And Dr. Engel, be sure to unmute yourself. 
Thank you. You'd think we'd all be used to this by now. We've been living on Zoom and um, we all have this lapse. I certainly did. Um, we've been uh, mobilized um, to try and um, have discussions, have uh, open forums, have opportunities for students to uh, participate, ask questions, to talk to people that are different from them. Uh, June 15th, I sent out a letter to the campus and called out all the vice chancellors to help with certain specific tasks and uh, to uh, help us look at the operation of our campus and ensure that we're um, casting a broad net, that we have ways for people to bring issues to our attention, ways to follow up, and uh, ways to ensure that everyone is respected in our campus community. Um, so we will certainly uh, con continue to do that. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a response, an update. I'm gonna have a series of meetings with uh, student groups and organizations over the fall semester. Uh, meet with faculty and staff of color to um, hear some of their um, issues and uh, ensure that we're being responsive and, and listening. I don't know, Dr. Freeman has been ex very involved in, um, you know, in student life and um, I'll let him uh, comment on this also. Yeah, I, I think uh, Chancellor, what you've outlined is certainly the case. Uh, it is a campus responsibility around the experience that our faculty, staff and students have. Uh, on the campus and it is one that we want to certainly take a listening ear and understand uh, where they are and, and what their experiences are and learn from each other on how to grow. And so our goal as we enter this fall is to um, have opportunities to have listening sessions where we learn from each other uh, and then education to follow as we uh, continue to grow. So uh, it is certainly our goal to do that and, and we will do that as we enter the fall semester. I know we are um, down to the uh, very end here. I don't know if we wanted to, there's, there is one question that was asked. Um, I believe it's better to be safe than sorry. Why is UTC willing to jeopardize students, faculty, and staff health when it's safer for all of us to stay home and switch online? Um, that um, certainly is something we're looking at. We're trying to provide as many options as we can. We've looked at opportunities for our faculty and staff. If they have some um, risk factors uh, to provide them the opportunity to work from home, there's some faculty and staff who want to teach in a face-to-face -face manner. And we have some students who want to learn in a face-to-face -face manner. And we have some who want to learn online only. So we're trying to provide many different options for students and for faculty and staff uh, during this semester. There are some courses that are almost uh, essential to be offered in a face-to-face -face manner, or at least some part of those courses. You think about the laboratory experiences, you think about studios, you think about clinicals for, for nursing. Um, so there are a number of places where um, we will, um, as we would move courses online, if there are, uh, is an outbreak of COVID-19, um, we'll try to retain some things in a face-to-face -face manner, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, but we're trying to provide as many options as possible and to maintain the quality of the educational experience. When you look at what it means to get a college degree, it's certainly not just what you get in a classroom. That is extremely important. And we have faculty who are active scholars who are engaging our students and um, seeing in them sometimes what our students don't know they're capable of. That's an important part of our experience. The clubs, the organizations, the um, working on projects together, even if it's in a virtual sense, 
are also a very important part of the education of our students. And we're trying to do the best we can there with small groups, um, breaking things up into smaller numbers, to having online options for students so that we can uh, provide as many opportunities as possible for our students uh, to, to grow as individuals, uh, to be able to become good citizens of, of this society, uh, to understand working together on a diverse team. When you look at students from different backgrounds um, who are trying to work on a project like uh, a uh, business startup, it's the engineering idea that powers things, but without a good marketing plan, without managing the different aspects of a project, it goes nowhere. Um, so we will continue to do, to do the best we can. If there's some questions we uh, did not get to, we will get the answers uh, uh, put together to those and get them posted. I encourage you to reach out to people at UTC. You can look up our email addresses. Um, it's first name hyphen last name at utc.edu. So mine is Stephen with a V-E-N, S-T-E-V-E-N hyphen angle at utc.edu. Um, we may direct uh, some of your questions to people who um, know a little better sometimes, uh, but we will make sure we get your questions answered. So we appreciate your confidence. Um, we're hoping to help our students uh, maintain progress to a degree as our economy recovers and we manage this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our students are gonna be prepared to go out into the world and to take on the challenges of our society. And um, we're hoping they don't have to stop their education for a year, but they continue to make progress and move forward. So thank you so much for being a part of this discussion tonight and Continue to ask questions, continue to engage. Any of the people on the call here would be happy to um, take your questions, direct them, and uh, just uh, you know, know that we take very seriously the health and safety of this campus community and we'll do everything we can to keep them safe and to maintain the quality of our educational experience. So thank you so much. We appreciate you being a part of this. Look forward to what this um, very new fall will be for all of us. But we have a team of professionals that are going to do everything they can to make this the very best academic year in UTC's history. Um, the president of the UT system, Randy Boyd, says, uh, you know, that we're not going to be defined by COVID-19. Um, we're going to be uh, responding in a way that defines this university with distinction for the future. So thank you all for being a part of this and go Mox.